And moving on. All right. Um, so we've been, uh, been our, in our series on twisting twisted scriptures. Um, I think in 2016 we called it Untroubling Troubling Scriptures. And I think um, this has been really helpful to me, again, because it helps me to be able to answer some of the tough questions that we get, particularly from people who are, who are unchurched, who are unfamiliar with Scripture, and form some pretty, pretty dogmatic judgments about Scripture and don't really, don't really know it. And I think that's partly because they've asked Christians these questions, and Christians don't know how to answer them. So I think it's helpful to, to arm yourself with, with these answers. I, I, I want to um, encourage you, before I get into this, not to play Russian roulette with Scripture. You ever do that? Uh, where am I going to read today? You know, we'll just hope, hopefully it'll open up. And, and, and I'm sure that you've been, you've been inspired, but you can't do that with Scripture. I think, uh, I remember back in, in my days of being an English, English student, I was actually thinking that I was going to be an English major, major, but I never went that direction. Uh, I don't think I have enough patience to, to teach young people. <laughs> because I'm, I'm like that. I'm just ADD. But anyhow, um, you got to remember that the Bible is a lot of books. It's not one book. It's a lot of books. And there's like books of poetry, and there's Proverbs, and there's the Gospels. It, it's, it's broken up that way, and I think sometimes we think that we can, we can just, just, first of all, randomly just open the Bible, and, and I think that you can get something out of it, and the Lord can speak to you that way, but, but the Bible was not written, uh, written to be read that way. And I think that we got to remember that it's, that it's many, many books. And in, in, in the New Testament, there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of letters. And I think when you, when you approach studying, studying an ancient manuscript, and the Bible is an ancient manuscript, even though it's written in English. It wasn't, obviously, it was not originally written in English. I think it's important for us to, to, be, to be good students and go back and try to understand um, who wrote it. A good, a good Bible study method, and you can look this up online, you can Google it. It's called the inductive Bible study method. I would encourage you, if you haven't found a good method to study scripture, and maybe the inductive Bible study method doesn't work for you and you have another method and that's great, but I'd encourage you develop a method of studying scripture. Don't just read it. Study it. Try to understand what it meant for the, for the original hearers or readers of the, those words and then, and then what it means to us. And the inductive Bible study method teaches you um, how to make observations in the text that you're, you're reading. And it's basically the four W's, who, what, where, why, and when. Those are important questions to ask yourself when you're reading scripture. And then it's the interpretation, understanding what the words mean. It, um, I think we're just under the assumption because it's written in English, it's just all, every, every word is actually figured out and communicated well, but they're not. I find when I study, when I study scripture, particularly in, in, in Hebrew, that, um, th that the words, they, they don't take on a different meaning, but, but they just get bigger. The meaning just gets bigger. So it's really important to, 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 to begin to interpret what you're reading. And then of course, all scripture is there for us to be able to apply, not equally apply, because you know I say all scripture is authoritative and inspirational in the sense that God, God breathed those words into men and they, they penned them and they wrote them down, but, but it's not all equally applicable to us. And I think that's, what, that's what's being revealed in the series of messages. There's, there are things that are written that really were not written specifically for us and they don't have specific meaning to us while we can draw application from it. So I think it's uh, important instruction as you read and study the word. And also we gotta remember that we're in a, in a spiritual battle. Some of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about, particularly in the Old Testament with, with regards to war and violence and slavery and all those things, uh, I, th I, think, I think the picture of the spiritual environment is almost clearer in the Old Testament than the New. You know, we're in the midst of a spiritual battle, and there's casualties of war in that battle. And I, I think we know that. We've experienced that personally with, with you know, family members who have, have suffered from things and, um, you know, they, they weren't healed or, uh, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a battle. And I think sometimes we forget that in Western culture because we're so insulated from what, what is going on in the rest 
of the world. Um, but we're in the midst of a, of a battle, spiritually. And uh, I also believe that God's people, Christians, as sons and daughters, have incredible influence and authority in shaping history. I think that we forget sometimes that I, I, I'm troubled. I, I'm a little bit troubled by this. And I've talked to actually spiritual leaders about this. And they use expressions that, that, that kind of make me cringe. Because, because if, if you ascribe God to this, that, that he's exhaustively controlling things, then you can blame God for terrible things that happens. And I have, this, I have this expression, God's not in control, he's in charge. You know, if you go back at the beginning in, in Genesis and you follow the path of God's people all the way through the New Testament and the New Covenant, you'll see that God puts mankind in charge of many things. He gives, us, he gives us authority. So a lot of the things that we see happening in the Old Testament that make us feel really uncomfortable are happening not because God wills them to happen. They happen because mankind has neglected taking authority. And they neglected walking in his ways. And, and the Old Testament reveals that. So I think it's important to remember that as we, as we study through some of these passages of Scripture. Now, I wasn't going to spend a whole service on this particular subject, but I decided to uh, come back around to it a couple Sundays ago. I just touched on a couple passages in the New Testament that, 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 that talk of, of slavery, but I had quite a few people come up to me and ask me to expound on it more. So I'm going to spend more time on it this Sunday because it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead somewhere next, next Sunday. I want to read this, uh, this quote. Uh, I can't remember where I found this, but in some of my research, uh, people who really struggle with some of the things that are recorded in the Old Testament have kind of a, a bent perspective. And I, I wanted to share this. And this is, I want to share this quote because I think it magnifies and, and, and really points to the fact that how important it is for us to really understand these things. Because there are people out there that, that, that have misperceptions about who God is in the character of God. And the only way they're going to really see the true God, the one true God, is through our example and sometimes it's even through our words and our knowledge of who God is. This is the, the quote. The Bible supports and regulates slave ownership and doesn't say that owning a slave is wrong. White Christians have often used the Bible to convince themselves that owning slaves is okay, which is true. And slaves should obey their earthly masters. White Christians also owned white slaves during and after the fall of the Roman Empire. And, and that's... Not really true because nobody in that era was really white. They were Middle Eastern. So to say that white Christians need to believe that their slaves are inferior to them in order to justify slave ownership is also false. A slave is a slave in the mind of white Christians and that, and, and that have owned them and the Bible supports slave ownership. For me, one verse, there, for me, one verse in the Bible that condemns, there's not one verse in the Bible that condemns owning slaves. I dare you. I've already found several that support it. Your God should be destroyed. Here are Bible verses that support slave ownership in the, New, in the New and the Old Testament. Some I mentioned a couple Sundays ago. Some I'm going to go over today. There was this thought back about 400 years ago in the slave trade, you know, promoted by actually white pastors, white preachers, that, that the black community was cursed by Ham. In Genesis 9.25, it actually isn't Ham that's cursed. It's actually Canaan that's cursed. But, but, they, but somehow they draw out the, the skin color, and skin color is never actually even mentioned in that, in that passage of Scripture. So, you know, to support the, the, the slave trade in, in America and in Europe, they came up with these weird, twisted biblical Scripture verses that so, somehow supported them, them owning and selling and selling slaves. Um, so we know that the Bible has been used as ammunition to really build lies and support sinful, sinful things. But just because the Bible mentions slavery doesn't mean that the Bible condones it. I want to give you a picture of what the world lo looked like in biblical times. This is why it's so important to not just read the Bible in context, but understand understand other works that were actually written around biblical, uh, biblical times. If, if people had a good picture of the environment and the rest of the world, when they read the Bible, they would think, the Bible's wonderful. 
that there are rules and there's regulations and, and there, are, there are things that God, God supports among, among his people that bring peace and they bring prosperity and they bring health and wholeness. I think that people um, who, who don't understand the, the culture back then when they read the Bible and, and it talks about some of these, the, these difficult things, they get troubled by it because it, it, it doesn't seem like, like God is saying, don't do it. But the, the fact is, he does. And I want to show you in, uh, in a few passages of Scripture how God... Um, see, this, the reason why I, I started out this message saying that, that God is not in control, but he's in charge, is that a lot of these things that existed in biblical times were not because God sanctioned it. It's because man walked away from him. And because they walked away from him, they instituted things that, that, that brought mankind and humankind pain. But there were laws that were written very early on in Scripture that was actually supposed to protect. Um, it's, it's like God is working with mankind. He's working to change their heart because, because God gave mankind the, the rule and the reign and the dominion and, and the authority in this earth. He's expecting mankind to make this earth better with his help and with his direction. There's a few passages in Scripture that are not often read, and obviously not read by this person that I quoted earlier on. It's in Leviticus. I want you to write these passages down. I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spew out a lot of Scripture verses, and I'm not going to have a lot of time to elaborate on them. So I really want to encourage you to write the references down so you can study it on your own. But in Leviticus 19.33, it says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You know, so he, he, he was reflecting on the fact that, remember, you were foreigners in a land, and, many, and, and, and you were enslaved at, at one point. I want you to, I want you to remember that, that you were mistreated, and I don't want you to mistreat the foreigner in the land. This passage in Leviticus shows us the importance of treating aliens and foreigners well and how if they believe, they, they become part of the people of God. Just like Rahab and Ruth, were, they were not originally Israelites. They weren't Jews. But because of, because of these laws, because of God wanted, wanted his people to be different than everybody else in the world, he instituted these laws so that foreigners can actually be introduced to who God is and his ways. Leviticus 25, 47 through 49 says, If a foreigner residing among you becomes rich and any of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells themselves to the foreigner or to a member for the foreigner's clan, they retain the right of redemption after they have sold themselves. One of their relatives may redeem them. An uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in their clan may redeem them. Or if they prosper, they may redeem themselves. Now, remember, this culture... This culture that the Israelites were in, everyone else around them had slaves. Slavery had nothing to do with nationality and had nothing to do with color of skin in biblical times. You know, if, if you, you, you besieged a particular, particular people group or a country, often if, if everyone was not killed, they would take, they would take those, those people from that country or from that city and they would make them slaves. And the slaves were, were like property to them, and they were incredibly abused. But that is not the case among the people of Israel. There were, there were laws and regulations on how you had to treat slaves of, of people in, in countries that, that would attack the nation of Israel. God gave specific instruction that, that even if a foreigner, an Israelite, indebted themselves to a foreigner that was part of their community, there were laws and regulations on how that person was to be taken care of. And there was always this, this right of redemption. After, after six years, see, slavery, slavery in biblical times around the nation of Israel really was about contract work, being an, an indentured servant. There was no social services. There was no welfare. If someone was destitute, they would often indebt themselves to someone who was wealthy. And when that debt was paid off, they were released from that contract. That's what this right of redemption is. And, and, 
there were provisions in the law. I'm going to read these passages in a minute. There were provisions in the law that actually every six years, whether it was paid off or not, God was saying it was paid off. So if, so if you were working for a particular owner and you owed a certain debt, it, and maybe it wasn't all paid back, at the end of that sixth year, God said, God would say, it's all paid back and you have to release them from their debt. See, God didn't invent or encourage slavery. Mankind did. And as we already know, slavery was common in the Middle East as far back as ancient Egypt. And really, the first slaves that, that are mentioned in culture and in the Bible were the Israelite slaves. They were enslaved by Egypt. If God simply ignored it, then there would have been no rules for their treatment, and they would have been treated harshly with no rights. But since they did have rights and rules for their protection, it showed that God cared as well for them. See, slaves were ignored. Outside of the nation of Israel, slaves were property. They were pieces of furniture. They were not considered people. That was not the case with the nation of Israel. Exodus 21.16 says, He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or he is found in his hand, shall be surely put to death. See, that's forced slavery. He, he never permitted forced slavery. He said, if, if, you, if you kidnap a man, if you take a man, or you take a woman, or you take a child, and you enslave them, you will be put to death. There was severe punishment in, in discipline and enforcement of these things. The idea of forced slavery was not permitted in, in the nation of Israel. Exodus 21, 2 through 6 says, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives it, this, this gets a little confusing. I'm going to explain this also. If, the, if his master gives him a wife and she bears some sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, do not want to go free, then this master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he shall be his servant for life. You see, this is almost like a type of bankruptcy law. A person who was lost or found themselves lost in debt was absolutely destitute. He was no, there, there, was, there was no provisions for them. So they would often indebt themselves to somebody who was wealthy or someone who would take them in. Um, so it wasn't a forced agreement. It was actually voluntary. So why didn't, in this particular passage, why didn't the master let the woman and the children go? Why do you think that's the case? It says, if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons and daughters, so if the master gives this person who's indebted to the master a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. So the woman is also indebted to the master and they, have, they, get, they get married and they have children and if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and the children do, do not want to go free, then the master must take him before the judge and he, he shall take them to the door. The, the reason why the woman would not be free is because the woman had a debt to be paid. Now, if the woman had paid her debt or was at the end of the six-year mark, he had to release them all. The master had to release the, the man, the husband, the wife, and the children. my greatest supporter. What's wrong with the front row? Nobody in the front row does that. I mean, you're close enough to almost give me a high five. There are so many other passages of scripture that speak to the nation of Israel on how to treat people in general. It's, there's no way that I can get through it in, in one service. Um, the problem with some of these passages if you don't have a good picture of what it was like in biblical times, I would be asking the same questions. I mean, why don't they just do away with slavery? This is terrible. But slavery back in biblical times, specifically with the nation of Israel, was very different than the slavery that we have in our mind. Because when we mention word, the word slave and slavery, we get terrible pictures in our mind because of what happened in this country. But slavery, in biblical times, 
And not just with the nation of Israel. You can see this in Roman culture in the New Testament. I'm going to read some of the New Testament passages. Slavery was very different in biblical times. It had, it had nothing to do. You can't find any biblical evidence of this. It had nothing to do with the color of your skin and the ethnic group that you were from. And if you trace all of history back, it doesn't matter what people group, every people group had slaves. And every people group was enslaved. This was, this was just the culture. Thank God we live in a very different world today. But biblical times was not the world that we live in today. And so to have these rules and regulations around this, this system of indentured servants or slavery was actually, actually revolutionary. If, if you read these, the, the book of Moses back then, you would think, you know, this is, this is like, this is off the charts. I, I've never read anything like this before. I, I, I want to go live with the nation of Israel. That's what you would be thinking. But because of our context, we have this certain filter that we look through when we read these passages of Scripture. Even as Christians, we find some of these things offensive because it does seem like it's condoning it. But it's not condoning it. But God, God is in the business of changing us and his people from the inside out. God does not want to control puppets. We have a free will. He's leading them. He's a good God, and he's leading them in the right way, but he still gives man free will, and, and, and man, because he has free will, can choose not to do it God's way. And not only will that person suffer, sometimes the innocent people around them suffer because God d- given us this world to manage. I want to go back to some New Testament passages that I touched on a couple weeks ago. Before I do, I want to read an, uh, a commentator or an author that I've been um, digging into. His name is N.T. Wright. Many of you who study the word know who he is. But he said, in the ancient world, anyone could become a slave. All you had to do was to be on the wrong side of the losing battle or suffer a major business failure. Slavery had nothing to do with ethnic background or skin color. Skin color. The economic realities in Jesus' world were such that debt could lead to imprisonment or slavery until the debt was paid off. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the passages uh, in, um, in, in uh, where was it that Paul was talking about? In, in Philemon, in his letter to Philemon, and also some passages in, in 1 Peter. So I have a question posed, were Peter and Paul pro-slavery? I want to define what slavery was, particularly in the New Testament. In ancient times, someone who did not have, it was someone who did not have the right of refusal, nothing more than furniture without a soul in New Testament times. They came from any ethnic background, and it wasn't race-driven at all. Some people sold themselves into slavery to avoid destitution. Others were forced into slavery as a result of combatants from war. Others were born into slavery. In urban centers in that day, in Christ's day, a third of the population in most cities, populated cities, were slaves. Slaves were susceptible to manifold abuse and exploitation, um, merciless labor, misery, and hardship. Women and children who were slaves were often forced into prostitution. Slavery was an indelibly part of the social, economic, and welfare structure of the ancient world. Slavery in, Roman, in the Roman first century was not even considered evil. It was just considered a necessity. It wasn't considered evil. It was considered a necessity. So, again, when, when you have this context, when you have this picture in New Testament times, when, when Paul and, and Peter were addressing slavery and slave ownerships, it was, it was revolutionary. It, w- it was... It was so out of the ordinary, people who read it were offended by it because slavery was, slavery was su- such a part of, of the economic and welfare system at that time. I want to read again these passages from Philemon that I read a couple weeks ago. So this is a, a plea to Onesimus, or a plea for Onesimus to Philemon. Paul knew both of these individuals. I think Paul was probably instrumental in Philemon's salvation. So Philemon is this master, this uh, slave master or uh, 
Onesimus was his servant. It's actually, it's actually called bond servant. So Onesimus really was not a slave, but he was, he was a bond servant. He was like a contract worker for Philemon. So this is what Paul says to him in this letter. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. So, so Paul is saying, I could just tell you to let him go. And you would probably respect it because you consider me your spiritual father, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let you know, the love in you make this decision. You need to make this decision on your own. I'm not going to manipulate it. Yet for love's sake, i rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chains. So Onesimus was, was taking care. He got saved. He was taking care of Paul while Paul was in prison, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. He wasn't profitable because Onesimus took off. But I'm sending him back to you. And evidently, Onesimus was okay with this. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For, pa- for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially for me, but, but how much more to you, but in the flesh and in the Lord. See, Paul is actually calling Onesimus a slave, a brother in the Lord. And he's, and he's telling Philemon to receive him, not as your servant, not as a piece of furniture, but as a brother in the Lord. So Paul urges Philemon to accept Onesimus in a way that radically alters the slave-master relationship. This is what God does all throughout Scripture. God's grieved by these things. He's grieved by violence. He's grieved by war. He's grieved by racism. But, but, but in a sense, it's out of God's hands except to work through his people, work through the Holy Spirit with, with conviction. And, and because he's given mankind authority and he won't take that authority away from mankind. But he leads them in the right direction. I want to talk about this passage in, in Peter, 1 Peter 2, 18 through 20. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if you are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when conscience of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. I want to read a passage of scripture that comes right before it. This is 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visits, or the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor and supreme authority or to to the governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you may silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect for everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. I'm going to read another passage in a minute, but I want to stop here. for What is, what is Peter trying to do, trying to communicate and encourage this young Christian church? He knew that there were evils in the world, he knew that the people that he was telling to submit, to submit to their authority were corrupt, they were ungodly, they did terrible things, but he's telling them that these people were appointed by God to bring peace, and it was relatively peaceful because of, because of Rome and, 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 and their government and, and their, their, their control. Uh, it was a re- rel- relatively peaceful time, even though there was, 
there was still evil and there was still corruption. God was telling them, this is the way that I want you to get my message across. Not to, not to rise up. I don't want a political uprising. The best thing that you can do is just be an example. Don't retaliate evil for evil, but blessing for evil. This is what Paul and Peter were trying to teach this young church. I want to read another passage in, in 1 Peter. It's later on. It's in chapter 3, 1 through 7. Um, has nothing specifically do, to do with slavery, but it drives home my point. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, but by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold and jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of gentle, a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight, for this is the way the holy women of past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah, who, who obeyed Abraham and called him to their Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. First of all, to even address women in this culture was revolutionary. A woman who was reading this would have been really encouraged, first of all, because, because Peter, an apostle of this early church, a teacher, a founder of the church, was actually addressing them. Because even in Jewish culture, they weren't a whole lot more than furniture. They didn't have many rights. They weren't to be seen on the streets. They had to be, they had to be covered up. You know, so, so what Paul was saying would have actually really encouraged women. Now check the next passage out in verse 7. This would have ruffled some feathers with the men. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Now, they only used that expression, weaker, weaker partner, again, to talk about physical weakness. But back then, the Jewish men thought of more than just physical weakness. Some of them blamed women for sin in the world. But respect them as the weaker partner, but as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. See, God was telling these women, who may have had husbands who were not Christians, to submit to their husbands, to love them through your example of humility in love and servanthood, hopefully they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. All these instructions in the New Testament that, that in some of them seem like, well, why didn't you just come right out and say slavery was a sin and don't do it anymore? I mean, I've read that letter from from Paul to Philemon multiple times. And I'm thinking, I would have just been really upfront with him and told him, release the guy, forgive him of his debt, let him go. But what would that teach him? What would that teach Philemon? Maybe to be submissive to Paul, but it wouldn't have been a compassionate act on his part. He would have been manipulated by Paul. Our, our best tactic as believers to influence culture is by, by our example. Sometimes by our words, but more by our example. And what Paul and Peter were telling women and slaves who were just basically property back then, by you demonstrating love, of the love of Christ, by you demonstrating obedience, by you demonstrating submission, by you not sneering when they say something wrong to you, by you demonstrating what, what I've called you to demonstrate, something will change in their heart and in their mind. First Peter, or I'm sorry, not Peter, Galatians 3.28. I read this passage a couple weeks ago. If you want to get Peter and Paul's and the early church's perspective on gender, race, culture, this is it. This passage of Scripture sums it up. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither is there male or female, 
for you are all in one, one in Christ. This is, they knew that they couldn't accomplish this overnight. So they just had to teach, the, teach those who were, had to be submitted or subjected in that type of culture to do that, but reveal something different. Do it willingly. And, and, and where you were not serving before because you weren't required by your master, d- do extra. I want to close with this, a few things to remember with regards to slavery. Slaves under the Mosaic law were different from the harshly treated slaves of other societies, more like servants and bond servants. The Bible does not endorse, uh, does not give an endorsement of slave trader, but the opposite. A slave or a bond servant was acquired when a person voluntarily entered into when, when he needed to pay off debts. The Bible recognizes that slavery is a reality in the sin-cursed world and doesn't ignore it, but instead gives regulations for good treatment by both masters and servants and reveals that they are equal under Christ. Israelites can sell themselves as slaves or bond servants to have their debts covered, make a wage, have housing, and to be set free after six years. Foreigners can sell themselves as slaves and bond servants as well, but in the nation of Israel, after six years, they had to be released. The Bible does not condone slavery any more than it condones polygamy or divorce. Instead, it establishes human limits for an existing evil system. The law of Moses laid the groundwork for eventual demise of one of the most demeaning institutions in human society. Biblical Christians led the fight to abolish slavery. We know this by William Wilberforce and other leaders. You see, the believers were to win favor and change hearts by their example. They were not to retaliate against the hostility of the wider culture. Their posture was to be characterized by harmony, sympathy, love, and humility. They must not repay evil for evil, but instead repay evil for blessing. People must not be won over just by arguments, by Christ-like examples. I wrote that as I, I ended my study last night because that's the application for us. You know, we live in a culture where um, people may not live the way that we live. Um, they may retaliate against your good works. They, they may not show patience and discipline. They may be participating in sinful activities, but they don't need judgment from the church. They don't need a pointing finger. When it came to those who were not in the church and those who were unchurched, um, the disciples were taught to be compassionate. And the disciples taught the early church, you're not going to win them over by telling them what to do. You're going to win them over by serving them. This is why Paul would call himself a a bondservant of Christ. And the Greek word there is doulos. Uh, Natalie shared this um, Friday night at... at, uh, the regional worship, but doulos is the Greek word for bondservant, and it means one whose will is all cons- altogether consumed with the will of the other. So Paul was saying, my will, my will is consumed with your will, Jesus. And how did Jesus come? Did he come on a horse with a shield and a sword? Did he come to be a military leader? He came as a servant, as a bondservant to mankind. The God of this world, This world wouldn't have existed without the Word, and Jesus was the Word. Comes as a baby, grows up in a humble environment, and demonstrates, and it was a perfect example of, of being a servant to mankind. And because Jesus was that example for us, I don't know how many Christians there are in the world today, but it wasn't won by military might or strength. It was won by being a servant, by being a bondservant. And Christ asks that of us. Our most effective weapon is the love and the compassion and the servanthood that God has put in us. If we could wire ourselves that way, if we could be concerned less about convincing people and just by being a loving example, we would be incredibly effective at, at winning souls. For Christ, people would want to be around us because we, because we're full of peace and we're full of compassion.
We are to approach incredible just injustice in our culture the same way the Christians of the first century, not taking up arms or any such violent act. We are not to speak with malice and contempt to those who disagree with us. We are to love when we are unloved. You know, I think of some of the things that have been legalized in not just in this country, in many countries of the world. For instance, abortion. Our most effective weapon in fighting against this, and this is something that's reprehensible, is to work within the system to change the laws. It's not to kill an abortionist. And, and people have done that in the name of Christianity. But all that does is stain what the Lord wants us to do and the people that God is raising up. Our best weapon is, is prayer. We, we, need to, we need to raise our voice. We need to support or organizations that, that provide op options like Compass Care. Um, we, we need to compassionately take care of those who are actually considering it, not condemning them and judging them, but loving on them, presenting other, other opportunities, but loving on them. There are, there are just like in this, in this New Testament culture, we live in a culture where, where there's incredible injustice. And God wants us to be available to shift those things. But we're not going to do it by might, by flexing muscles. We're going to do it through love and compassion. And that's, what, that's what, what Paul and Peter were trying to get through to this first century church. So I, I just pray that we can, we can learn from this. That, Lord, you would, you would change our tactics. Maybe some of us don't have tactics at all. Maybe some of us just have to begin to open up, to establish relationships with people who, who are around us, to take the time to invest in other people's loves, maybe, lives. Maybe, maybe some of us haven't even started. So Lord, I pray that, that you would, would convict us. There, there have been many times in my life where my life is just so busy, I don't take the time for people. But Lord, you've put us on this earth to be ambassadors an, ambas an ambassador is, is engaged with the people, serving the people. So, Lord, if, if through your Holy Spirit, if we just need to be prodded a little bit to, to just make that first move, I pray that you would do that. But, Lord, in, in all of us, that we would learn to demonstrate who you are, that we, we would allow you to live through us, that we would we would let you out. I think sometimes we keep you captive in us and nobody can see you in us. But Lord, we need your heart and your, your compassion for people. And Lord, I pray that you would, would, would drive us and you would motivate us to live out this, these incredible teachings that you taught this first century church are, are here for us to apply. As we live out this, this walk and we live out your teachings, we can change and shift and revolutionize culture. But it's going to be by changing the hearts of men and women. So Lord, give us relationships, give us creative strategies to do all those things that you've called us to do. And we just thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.